And I read up until 9.30 on New Year's Eve night and I hit my 100th book of the year. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse. So I read 17 books in December, which is crazy. I have not read that many books any month this year and I don't think any month ever, but all I wanted to do was read. And I think after spending November writing almost the entire month and reading four books, all I wanted to do was read and I just gave myself the grace and the permission and the time to do it. So full disclosure, I did do a whole bunch of audiobooks. There's a bunch of short books in here. So I'm going to see if I can kind of give you minor plot, a little opinion, and then on to the next. Okay, so let's talk about a book that I loved. And I expected to really enjoy this book and I thought it was going to be fun and it completely just blew me away. It was such a good book and such a good story and it's The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes and this is another YA thriller mystery and again sort of in that vein of truly devious. So our main character Avery is just smart and witty and clever and she's not going to back down and she's not going to give up and she's not going to throw in the towel and she's like a little bit of a badass and I just love her and she just stands up for herself and she's just such a great character. She is a junior in high school and basically she just wants to get a scholarship, wants to get out of town and just wants to go live her life. But she's kind of like quasi living with her stepsister who has a really crappy boyfriend and kind of some nights she's sleeping in her car. So this guy shows up at school and he comes to tell her that she has been named in the will of Tobias Hawthorne, who is this bazillionaire down in Texas, and she needs to come down for the reading of the will. And she has no idea who this man is. She has no idea why she's in his will. But her and her sister go down, and sure enough, he leaves his inheritance to her. And even though he has two children and four grandsons, she gets it all, and nobody knows why. And the hitch is she needs to spend one year living in his compound, if you will, in Texas in order to inherit everything. But meanwhile, his entire family also lives on the compound. So she basically has to stay alive, even though killing her doesn't mean they get the money, but it doesn't stop bad things from happening to her. So this is such great fun. There's so many twists and turns. It's totally putting a puzzle together. And I just loved it. This is not a short, short book, but I devoured it really quickly. This was my Christmas morning, <laughs> like in a nutshell. <laughs> and I had so much fun with it. So this is the first in a series, it turns out, which is great. So again, like Truly Devious, you have a mystery resolved, but you have a door left open. The only bummer is it doesn't come out till like September of 2021. So, ugh. The upside is I get to read it again, but such great fun. Another book which I enjoyed way more than I thought I was going to, and I thought it was just going to sort of be like cotton candy-ish kind of fun, and it was, but it was also way better than I thought, is To Can Keep a Secret by Karen McManus. And this is a multiple timeline, multiple point of view, mysteries in the past, mysteries in the present, everything that I want out of a book with a twist on one of my favorite tropes, which I love a protagonist that has to go back to their small hometown that they got out of years ago and like just don't want to have to go back and deal with their secrets. And in this one, it is the twin children of a main character who have to go back to their mom's hometown because mom's in rehab and they have to go live with grandma to finish out their senior year in high school. And they start to find out a bunch of reasons why mom left town all those years ago. So we have mom's twin sister back in 1995 was walking home from the library and went missing. She was never found. Five years ago, we have the homecoming queen who was found murdered and the case was never solved. And now it appears that the murder is back. So this is just fun, twisty, like I said, multiple timelines, multiple mysteries, tons of suspects looking into things that happened five years ago. It reminded me a little bit of Good Girl's Guide to Murder in that. And you just have like a whole bunch of characters that you just don't know who to trust, who to like, who to like, who not to like. And I enjoyed this, the twins. I enjoyed their friends. I enjoyed the reveal of this one. I just had a fun time with it. I really, really did. 
So the next book I read was from my snowy winter read recommendations list that I did, and it's An Unwanted Guest by Sherry LaPena. And I feel like when I recommended this book, a lot of you guys were like, oof, I don't know. And oof, I get it. I didn't love this book and I'm sad about it. And this is Isolated Mystery. They're in the Catskills. It's a blizzard ice storm. It's a bunch of strangers who are trapped at the inn and somebody dies. And it's just, it's all the things. It's all the things it should be. But it just didn't, it just didn't do it for me. And I talked about this in another one of my videos. I think I talked about it in my least favorite books of the year, where I love the isolated mystery trope. And it's, it's hard to do. I'm trying to write one. I get it. And I'm also super, not judgy about it, but my expectations are like here about how to do the isolated mystery well. And there's a few things that missed the mark on this one for me. And one of them was that I didn't feel the tension in the book until sort of like the very end and not spoiling anything. So somebody dies and there's sort of this split feeling of like, it could have been an accident, but it could have been murder. And everyone's just sort of like, meh, it was probably just an accident. And they like go about their business, even though they have like no cell phone, no power, like everything's been blown out because of the ice storm. They're all trapped together and nobody seems all that worried about it, except for like one or two people. And I think there's like 10 or 12 of them that are here. So there's like two people who run the inn and then all the other guests. So I kind of feel like if somebody died when I was stuck at an inn, whether they were murdered or it was an accident, I would be kind of freaked out and also because like some people think maybe it's a crime scene. They just kind of put a sheet over the body and leave it there, but it's in a fairly public place. So like, I don't know, that just seemed weird to me. I mean, maybe I would be worried about the crime scene at some point, but they all have to like literally step over the dead body over and over again, which I just thought was strange. So I just, I didn't feel the tension between them. There was a lot of characters in this. And the writing I didn't think was the best. So one of the things, I actually flagged a page. Like that's how annoyed I eventually got by it. And I won't use names so you guys don't know like who's who or what's the what, I'll just use the pronouns. But literally, and this is all on the same page. So the first, first two sentences. She is glad he is gone. She thinks he's reckless, but she is glad he's gone. And then two paragraphs later, she thinks of her therapist, the woman who has been helping her to regain a sense of control over her life, or at least trying to. With her therapist's help, she's been trying to learn how to manage her negative thoughts. So I don't know if the repetition was like an intentional writing device, but it just felt, it felt like it just needed some better editing, to be honest. And it just kind of felt basic. I sound like a jerk. I just felt like it could have used a better editing job. Or again, I don't know if it was like a writing style and it was a deliberate choice, but it didn't feel deliberate to me. It just, it just felt not great. So that happened. And then my biggest beef overall is the ending and the reveal felt a little bait and switchy in that I don't feel like it was fair to the reader because I don't feel like we had all the information up front to be able to get to that conclusion. So it was a, when you've got these isolated thrillers, like anybody can be killed and anybody can be the killer. So obviously everybody was a suspect and there was a point where I suspected this person because you suspect everybody. But the reason behind what happened, we were never privy to, so it felt, it felt cheap to me that, that that was the reveal because we never had a chance of knowing it. So we never would have known the motive of anything. So I will say what was good about it is I thought the atmosphere was good. Like it was, it was cold and it was dark and I was reading this during a snowstorm here. So it gave me all of those vibes, which was great, but I didn't think the story was great. I didn't think the writing was great. And I don't think she played fair in this one. The next book is another one that has been on my shelf forever and it's called Everything You Want Me To Be by Mindy Mejia. And this is a book that I literally cover bought back in the day when you can go to a bookstore and <laughs> you could browse. It's like been on my TBRs before but I just didn't pick it up. And I finally did and I'm so happy I did because I really, really enjoyed the story. And again, it wasn't, it didn't wind up being what I thought it was going to be 
but I actually enjoyed it so much more. And it is a thriller, it is a mystery, but I also, I cried at the end of this one. Like, not like heaving tears, but I shed some tears at the end of this book. I'm a, I'm a crier, but usually not during thrillers. So, long story short, too late. This is about a girl named Hattie. So this is told in multiple points of view and multiple timelines. And out of the gate, Hattie is found murdered, brutally stabbed. And we have some police investigation. She lives in this super small town. And then we rewind kind of a year leading up to it. So we see Hattie's POV in the past. And I had no idea. I thought I knew. And this is one of those things where I also like, I thought I was smarter than the book and I wasn't smarter than the book. And I'm usually slash never smarter than the book, but I like thought I had something figured out and then it happened and it was like, oh wait, no, it's not that. But I was like, oh no, 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 this is what it is. And I was feeling all smart about myself. And I did not see the ending coming to this one at all. And I just loved it. I thought it was really well done. I thought it was a really interesting story. There's definitely some unlikable characters in this. I do enjoy some police detective work. It is as much about the mystery thriller part of it as it is about the grief of her parents, which was really, really painful in a lot of parts to read. The grief and the loss, I don't know why it, it struck a chord with me, but it really just hit me kind of like a ton of bricks in this book. And I think it really just added to the story, but I thought it was really well done. So this is the last book I read this year, and it's called Confessions on the 745 by Lisa Unger. And this is her newest book, and I loved it. This is a warped kind of strangers on a train type of a premise in that you have two women who are on the commuter train home one night, 745, and they both have basically had really crappy days. They're having a little airplane bottle of vodka and the train winds up getting stuck. So they wind up chit chatting and they both confess a secret to each other. So one confesses that she's having an affair with her married boss and he is married to the owner of the company and she's pretty freaked out that she's gonna get fired and she's basically like blown up her career. And then the other one confesses that she just found out that her husband is having an affair with the nanny. And stranger number one is kind of like, wouldn't it be great if our problems just disappeared and stranger number two is like I hear you girl but then the train starts moving again and stranger number two gets off at her stop and goes back to her life and then a couple days later her nanny goes missing and nobody knows that her husband was having an affair with the nanny other than the stranger on the train so what happened I loved it I loved this book you have multiple points of view I did Un like I did figure one little thing out before it was completely revealed, but I had no idea where the story was gonna go. I had no idea where the story was going to end up. And I loved it. I, I, you guys know, I love me some dark and likable characters. I like messed up people doing messed up things. I flew through this book and I couldn't recommend it enough. I thought it was such a great ride. I thought the writing was great. I thought the atmosphere was great. I thought the characters were great. I just loved everything about it. I listened to Five Little Pigs by Agatha Christie, and this is a Poirot, and I just loved it. So I am super slowly making my way through all of her books. And I want to say Anthony Horowitz had talked about this book in an interview I was watching with him. This one was fun in that we have two timelines. So we have a murder that happened 16 years ago, and it was sort of an isolated mystery in that it was like this fancy estate as it always is in a Christie novel. And a man was murdered and his wife wound up being convicted for poisoning him. And there were five people who were at the house that day, hence five little pigs. And 16 years later, the daughter of the couple comes to Poirot because she wants to find out what really happened that day. So she was a young child. She doesn't know what happened. And before her mother died, she wrote a letter to her, which was delivered to her daughter. And it just tells her like, I didn't do it. And she always maintained her innocence. And the daughter wants to know what actually happened. So Poirot goes to investigate the case and he interviews all of the different people who basically relive what happened in the past. And you get the same day from all of their perspectives. And like magic, he figures out what really happened. So 
I just, I loved it. I thought it was great. I really enjoyed it. It felt like a little bit something different. I haven't read a ton of Agatha Christie. I have gravitated towards a lot of her most popular ones, but I thought this was just a really clever story. I enjoyed all the different POVs, how everybody remembers things just a little bit differently and where their stories crossed over and where their stories differed. I would recommend this one because I thought it was great fun. Another audiobook I listened to is A Deadly Inside Scoop by Abby Collette. And this is a cozy mystery and it 100% should have been on my snowy recommendations list, but I didn't know it at the time. So this is all the cozy mystery vibes. We have a heroine who is returning to her hometown in Ohio. She is helping out with the family business, which is an ice cream shop. And we have a stranger in town who winds up dead. So she needs to amateur detective her way into this case and make sure that her family basically doesn't go down for this and she needs to find out who actually committed the murder. And this is, if you like the Aurora Tea Garden mysteries, if you like the Joanna Fluke, Hannah Swenson mysteries, it's all that. It is the perfect Hallmark movie and mystery. I could see this on the big screen. I hope it actually comes to TV because I imagine this is the first in a series. And I just really enjoyed it. It was like the perfect palate cleanser, snowy, icy, even though this takes place, like I said, around Halloween in Ohio, it was like the perfect book to read in the winter here. And I really enjoyed when I thought she was great. There's like some light romantic interest. There's the fun best friend sidekick. There's like all the interesting characters around the town. So this is everything that I would expect from a cozy mystery and very well done. And I would check it out. So like I said, this just came out. This is the first in the series. So if you're looking for a new cozy to read or a new cozy series to get into, I would definitely give this one a read. So I was itching for some self-help, some motivation. I need to get my life back on track. I need to kind of refocus my attention on things. So I started with some audiobooks. I wound up buying the books and it is the Gary John Bishop series. So it's unfuck yourself and stop doing that shit. And I'll be honest, I originally hesitated picking this up like way back because to me, I was like, oh, here's like another, the subtle art of not giving an F, which I read and didn't like. And it's like a shocker and people are gonna grab it because it's like, oh, the F word is in the title of it and like whatever. But I really like this book. And I was watching Catherine Manning who had read this, recommended it. She and I have, not, like we're not friends, but like we've read a lot of the same books and I've watched a lot of her content. And I was like, all right, if she likes it, I'm gonna give it a go. So I started with the audiobook. So he narrates both of them. I will just say this to you. I mean, self-help is self-help. I think, yes, a lot of these are things I've heard before, packaged differently. I think self-help books, self-help books are, kind of like exercise. Like there's only so many different exercises you can do lifting weights and you need to find what works for you. So the content, the messaging, a lot of it are things that I've heard before. His approach is a little bit different stylistically. He just gets right to it. These are short books. He, this is no muss, no fuss. He calls you out on your crap. There is no room for excuses. I like his style. It works for me. It is to me, it is finding the therapist. It is finding the like the right partner. It's finding the right doctor. You have to find what works for you. You have to find who you connect with. However you want to get your messaging, like whatever gets through to you, that's the way to go. And these work for me. So I listened to the audiobook of both of them. I wound up reading again the second one and I tabbed it up to no end. I need to tab up this one. And I picked up his workbook, which I started to read, but it's actually, it's probably gonna be like a three, four week process where you really start to dig into your own stuff. So I didn't finish that one this month, but I will. And I just think they're great. So I'm on a journey to getting better. Okay, let's speed things up a bit. So the next book is The Party by Robin Harding. And I actually wound up listening to the audiobook of this. And I'm trying to kind of get some stuff off my shelf that I've had for a long time because I need to clear some room. And this is a book that's going to get cleared from my shelf. So <laughs> it just, it was fine. I wanted more from it. It's kind of pitched as a thriller. It's a super wealthy family in San Francisco. It's their daughter's sweet 16. She has a slumber party with a bunch of girls from school. And then this really tragic accident happens at the slumber party at the parents' house. And this is the aftermath of, you know, what happens, who's to blame, 
and secrets and lies and deception and all that kind of stuff. So you get multiple points of view in this, which I like, but I just didn't feel like the secrets and the lies and the deception were like that dark and twisted and I kind of wanted them to be more dark and twisted. So to me, it just felt more like normal teenage stuff that you wouldn't tell your parents and just a dysfunctional marriage. And there were like a few things thrown in that I feel like were supposed to be shocking, but they just didn't feel super shocking to me. So I don't know. I didn't love it. I just kind of didn't love the characters. I love unlikable people doing unlikable things, but I just didn't really care about some of the characters here. So I stuck with it to the end because I wanted to know like the big, what was going to happen. But yeah, it's just like, it, it was just sort of generic to me. And what I also found a little bit annoying is, you know, so the girls are down in the basement having their party and something happens to one of the girls at the party and the parents are upstairs asleep and the entire book, like the parents are just like, like, it's not our fault. It's not our fault. Like we had, it, there was nothing we could have done. We're not liable. We're not culpable. It's not our fault. It's not our fault. It just got really old. Another book I did the audio of is In Five Years by Rebecca Searle. And the audiobook I will say is tremendous. So Megan Hilty is the narrator on this. So if you're gonna read this book, I would definitely go the audio way. And this is one of those books that was on my most anticipated list this year. And I heard a lot of reviews about it where people were like, that is not what I thought it was going to be. And it's not pitched the way that the story actually is again. So in this one, the back cover of this is it's about this woman, Danny, who is basically living her best life. Everything has just come together with her. So her boyfriend has um, proposed to her. She just landed her super job that she's wanted. Life is perfect, everything is great. And she goes to sleep one night and then she wakes up five years in the future. And she is living in a different apartment with a different man with a different ring on her finger. And she spends a sum total of one hour in this new future of hers, five years ahead. And she wakes back up in the present day, but she can't shake the dream and the guy and the what was that. And we wind up fast forwarding five years pretty quickly. And then when she meets that man five years in the future, it's like all bets are off. And it does say on the back of the book, like this is a love story, but not the love story you think it is. And I wound up listening to some interviews with the author. So I knew I wasn't going into this with that dual timeline love story bit of it. I did another, I did a good reads review for this as well. So you can check that like mine out or check other people's out if you're curious about it. I think even if you have a little bit of the spoiler on it, it's still a book worth reading. But if you're looking for easy breezy love story, this is definitely not that. So just my only thing would be go and knowing that but I thought it was well written. I thought it was well told. I enjoyed the characters. I liked how people ended up in it. And I liked the choices that our main character, Danny, wound up making in the end. Horn honk. So I wound up doing a combination of rereading a series slash finishing a series. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about all of these books, but it's the Charlotte Holmes series by Brittany Cavallaro. And this is about the great, great, great grandchildren, Charlotte Holmes and Jamie Watson of Sherlock Holmes and John Watson. And I read the first three books starting last December and I wound up listening to the audiobooks of them this December and the audiobooks are great. So, don't ask me who the guy is, but the woman who does Charlotte's narration is Julia Whalen. And if you guys are audiobook fans, you know who she is and she's tremendous. So the audiobooks are great fun, but this is basically, they meet in book number one, they are at a prep school in Connecticut and a classmate of theirs is murdered and they are the top suspects. So they wind up partnering up and having to solve the crime. So for book number four, which is the one I actually read this month, I didn't listen to the audio, I read it. This to me, I will say was my least favorite of the four books. And I feel like this was conceived as a trilogy and this was, the trilogy was so successful, I'm gonna write another book. And in the acknowledgements, like she even says like, hey readers, this one's for you. So I feel like she did a little bit of a thank you to her readers, wrote another book. There was a good mystery to this. It was, it just wasn't as compelling as the other ones, but what was good about this is it's 100% in Charlotte's POV, which was very interesting to see because normally we'd see a lot through Jamie's point of view. And 
I'm happy with how it ended up. I'm happy where everybody lands. The one thing that I did miss from this book is there is such an incredible cast of supporting characters throughout the first three. And we don't get really any of them in this book and I was missing a lot of people. This is a fun series to me. It reminds me a lot of Truly Devious in how smart it is and how things from the past influence things from the present. You've super complicated characters. There is, without getting into too much detail, but sort of across the books, we deal with everything from drug abuse to sexual assault to PTSD. There's a lot of family stuff going on here. There's grief, there's regret, there's unlikable people doing unlikable things. There is just great banter and great connection between them. There's a lot of just sharp, witty, fun characters in this. So I think it's a delicious series and I would recommend it. Next up is a book that I mentioned in a different video. I think when I was just kind of like catch you guys up on what was happening. And it's You Should Have Known by Jean Hanif Korolitz, excuse me. And this is the book that actually the TV show The Undoing on HBO is based on, which I didn't know when I started watching the show, but when I was watching episode one and figured that out, I was like, ooh, I have that book. I'm gonna hit pause, I'm gonna read the book. So without spoiling either, what I will tell you, no shocker, sorry, I'm sliding here, is the book and the movie are totally different, or the book and the TV show are totally different. So by, I would say like middle of episode two, that and the book were in two different places and they never come back together again. So TV show, high octane thriller, cliffhangers, twists, turns, just so much happening. And so many things that are in the book that don't happen in the TV show because you can only translate so much of it. And this to me is, it's kind of pitched as literary thriller, but this to me is just a very quiet story, which doesn't make it a bad story, but it is nothing like the TV show. So I think I would have enjoyed the show more had I not read the book. And to me, the show was fine, but I actually liked parts of the book a whole lot more. And the concept of this is that you've got this super rich, fancy Upper East Side couple. So he's a doctor, she's a psychiatrist. They have a teenage son who's in a private school. And one of the moms at school is found murdered. And it's just sort of like how everything falls apart from that point. And the book is very much about the mom, who's a psychiatrist, who has just written a book called You Should Have Known, basically calling people out on the fact that they don't see what's going on right in front of their faces. And she needs to basically reassess her entire life and figure out who she is, who she wants to be, how she can rebuild her life. And she goes on a very different journey than she does in the TV show. So I really liked this. It's definitely really slow. It's a very slow burn. I wouldn't call it thrillery. So even though you have the murder and you have some police investigation, it's more about her story. And I listened to a lot of this on audiobook and I read parts of it. So I will say it is to me a far more powerful story about her journey in the book than it is in the TV show. Again, something that was pitched as a thriller that's not a thriller in my book, but was still enjoyable. So not my most favorite book of the year, but it was good. The next book is And Now She's Gone by Rachel Housel Hall. And this is really like private investigator, noir, crime fiction, LA, kind of gritty, kind of dark. And I enjoyed it but I went in with the wrong, I went in with the thrillery expectation. So it took me a little while to kind of adjust my pace to the pace of the book. This book is about a woman named Gray who is kind of a newbie PI and she finally gets like her own real missing persons case. And she's super excited about it. And basically this guy has reached out because his girlfriend has gone missing, but he really only cares about the fact that she stole his dog and he wants his dog back. So Gray is on the case. She really starts to uncover a whole lot of secrets and a whole lot of lies. And the woman who's missing, Isabel, is an extremely complicated person she's finding out. And the more she digs, kind of the more mysterious and messed up things get. And this is told with multiple points of view. And Gray herself is a complicated character with a whole suitcase full of baggage. And as a newbie PI, which I really enjoyed, she makes mistakes. She's not always picking up on certain clues. She's jumping to some conclusions. She doesn't always have 
the perspective that she needs to have on the case. And I liked her as a character. So there was like one thing about the ending that I didn't love, and I talk about it in my Goodreads review, because it just felt a little bit too like, come on now, like you, you've gotta be kidding me. Like it seemed a little bit, a little bit silly. I would say I liked it, didn't love it. There were parts where I feel like the writing didn't totally work for me, and I feel like that's where I struggled with her first book as well. So I didn't wholly connect with the writing of this, but I did enjoy a lot of the story. And unfortunately, you know, much like an unwanted guest, when the ending doesn't totally feel plausible for me, it definitely impacts my overall experience with the book, but I'm glad I gave it a go. So those are my 17 books for December, and if you have made it this far, I will let you know that I found one of my favorite books of the year in this pile, and I'm very excited about it. So let me know if you've read any of these. Thank you guys for hanging out so much today, and I'll see you in another video. Bye, everybody.